Thank you, Jacob. You're welcome. And, and thank you, Giovanni. And thank you, Disha, for the invite. Um, so let me start screen sharing. And you see the slide? Yes. OK, perfect. Yes. All right. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sid. And um, I'll tell you some of the work I've done in the past on uh, fish locomotion, uh, both past and present work. Um, we'll, we'll first talk about collective behavior, then sensing in fish, and then some peculiar locomotion locomotion patterns that uh, they display. So all of the work I'll show you was done in collaboration with many, many people. I have just mentioned a few of them here. And um, uh, so let's, let me start with the first topic, collective swimming. And we're all very familiar with um, these um, very distinct coherent groups that fish tend to swim in. Um, and there, these, there's many um, explanations for why they might prefer to display this collective behavior. Many people suggest this is social behavior. So swimming in large groups allows them to avoid attacks from predators. Um, also, when you work together, you might, it might be easier to find uh, food. There's another school of thought that goes, um, okay, there, it's possible that there might be a hydrodynamic advantage of swimming in groups, uh, very in, in the same way that geese flying in V formations tend to uh, experience a benefit. And this idea is not new. It's, um, there's been a lot of work from since the 1950s and 60s on this. Uh, back then, um, the, uh, researchers were limited to using theoretical approximations. So for instance, on the right here, we have a picture of if fish were swimming in this diamond-like pattern, they would shed these point vortices and the way the follower interacts with these point vortices would help it um, decrease its swimming efficiency. So um, there have been more recent experiments and uh, simulations on this, but uh, many of them uh, use these sort of pre-assigned formations. So we started thinking, okay, in nature, all of this schooling happens very dynamically. The group keeps evolving um, in a dynamic manner. Would it be possible for us to create such a group swimming scenario uh, autonomously? Um, so we tell the fish, okay, your job is to maximize your swimming efficiency and you behave in a way that allows you to do that. Okay, so all of the uh, work um, that I'll show you today is uh, numerical primarily. Uh, one of, uh, in a later section, we'll talk about experiments very briefly. So just a brief overview of the numerical methods we use. We use uh, for the, all the two dimensional simulations I'll show you, we use the remeshed vortex methods uh, we just solve the Navier-Stokes equation in vorticity form. And we do the different uh, operations, advection, diffusion, and penalty uh, using a time-splitting approach. Also, uh, we use a wavelet adaptive grid. Uh, you can see there's a lot more grid points in regions where there's something happening in the flow, and there's almost no points far away from those regions. All right. Um, the first thing we started looking at was, okay, what's a very simple model of this group behavior? And we said, okay, let's take two fish and let them swim together. So we have a leader and a tra uh, trailing fish. Both, uh, both are, um, both use imposed undulations of the body and all the forward motion and the rotation happens because of the way the fluid uh, interacts with the undulating body. Okay, so here we have a simulation, both of them starting from rest. And uh, what happens is if we look at the graph on the right here, the blue curve is the speed of the follower. The red curve is the speed of the leader. So in this case, the follower seems to speed up at a certain point in time. 
So it's receiving a benefit by interacting with this oncoming wake. We changed just one thing, that is the initial separation distance. In the first case, it was some value one L. And in the next case, uh, oh, before I uh, go there, let me just point out that right exactly at this instance, when the follower interacts with this oncoming vortex is when it sees this benefit. Okay, so as I was um, saying, we changed the initial separation distance to a slightly different value. So this you'll, here you'll see it's 1.25 instead of one. And now we see the follower actually slows down compared to the leader. So interacting with an unsteady wake can be both beneficial or detrimental. Um, and it seems that it has to be done in a, a smarter way to uh, get a benefit all the time. There's another issue with this um, sort of a, an approach where these are completely self-propelled uh, swimmers with no constraints. So um, it's logical to, uh, well, it, it's, we can see very easily why this follower gets ejected from the wake when it interacts with the unsteady flow uh, from the leader. So after it separates, there's no more interaction, wake interaction for the follower. So um, this, uh, this tells us that we need to implement some sort of control. And here, um, there's two approaches we can think of. One is we want our follower here to basically stay in line with the leader. And that's an easy control problem. If the follower gets kicked too far to the right, you, uh, you uh, command it to turn its head to the left and it comes back slowly. And same thing, if it goes too far to the left, you uh, come back uh, by turning your head. But if we think about a more interesting question, uh, there's this unsteady wake and we want to extract energy from it. We want to benefit somehow energetically. How should we do it? There's no straightforward answer to this question. At least there wasn't when we started out. Um, and this is when we turn to um, a very useful machine learning algorithm called reinforcement learning. So the basic concept of reinforcement learning is there's an agent, let's call our mouse an agent, and it interacts with an environment. Let's say this maze is an environment and it has a goal. The goal of the mouse is to find this cheese. So um, just imagining what would happen in reality if we drop the mouse at random locations, um, it would basically do a trial and error search for the uh, for its goal, the cheese. But after, um, let's say, 60 or 100 experiments like this, the mouse forms a map of the maze in its head, and then it becomes much more effective at reaching its goal. Um, if we implement uh, this in a um, uh, this sort of a word search problem, we have the starting location for the mouse and we have the goal where it wants to go. It doesn't know that its goal is located in that corner. So um, eventually it'll, uh, it'll reach its goal and say, okay, let me look back at my previous steps and see what happened. So it looks back one cell and it says, okay, from coming from there to my goal, it took me one step. So I'll give that a negative one energy use. Same way you can put down numbers for all the cells. If you're in over here in this corner, it takes you four steps to reach your goal. So you expend four units of energy. Once we have such a distribution, we can basically use it to say, all right, we have our map of what actions we should perform when we are in a particular cell. So if we are in this cell over here, it is best to go down. It, it doesn't help if we go left or if we go up. So this now forms a model-free policy, okay? So that's the basic uh, concept of reinforcement learning. And there's a lot more um, uh, happening behind the scenes. There's uh, neural networks that we use as functional approximators. There's the recurrent networks that we use to account for time history. Um, but the essence is we have the agent environment, we have actions and reward. 
uh, and we have the state of the agent. So when talking about our fish, what are the actions? The actions are we can either turn left or right by changing our curvature, or we can um, keep going straight by decreasing our curvature. All right, and if you think about states, um, states is how does this agent perceive its environment? So since we are talking about swimming together, we said, all right, let the state be relative distance to the leader and the range from the leader. Then we think about what's the goal. So let's talk about the first um, easier control problem where the goal is to stay in line with the leader. So anytime you move away from this blue region, you start getting negative rewards. And the more uh, difficult control problem is if we just want to maximize swimming efficiency, we don't care how to do it. And that's in that case, we specified the reward to be efficiency itself. So maximizing reward leads to high efficiency. So let's look at what happens with the results. So the first um, goal one, uh, trying to swim in line with the leader. Okay, so the leader here is under human control, but the follower is con completely autonomous. It decides on its own what actions to take. And it's not as obvious in this case. Oh, uh, yeah, now you see it has changed its swimming amplitude. And all of that is happening through the reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, we, we play no part in uh, doing any of those changes. This, this will become more obvious in the, on the next slide when we talk about goal two. Okay, then um, uh, comparing the efficiency of this follower to this leader, uh, we have uh, that comparison on the graph here. And you can see the follower's efficiency hits very high values very, very frequently compared to the leader. So this was a surprise because the goal here is not to maximize efficiency, it's just to swim behind the leader. But still we noticed an average efficiency increase by almost 12%. So what was happening? Why, why does this happen? Uh, we looked at the data um, and we realized that if let's say the circles on the right graph here denote the starting position of the follower, it would always try uh, migrate to these X's and these X's indicate a stable, um, uh, stable attractor points, okay? Same thing, if we start off in a different location, it would migrate to this different X, but always consistently, it would migrate to the Xs. So the reason it does that is because the oncoming wake is periodic, it creates these very specific regions where the motion of the follower is synchronized with the flow direction uh, of the wake. And when this happens, you basically decrease your power required for swimming. So that, that was unexpected, but we were able to um, think uh, this music. Okay, all right. Um, uh, so we were able to um, uh, yeah, deduce the reason why this uh, inline swimming turned out to be efficient, even though that was not uh, an objective. Okay, so let's look at the result for goal number two, energy efficiency. In this case, you see it's more obvious. The smart follower basically becomes stops uh, undulating at some times and really does very extreme maneuvers at, uh, no, it doesn't do extreme maneuvers uh, that frequently. Um, but you can see the motion of the smart follower is very different from the motion of the leader. So in this case, again, we were surprised that the smart follower wants to interact with the oncoming wake. It chooses to do this. Um, I had thought that, okay, the smart follower will say, no, no, it's not very um, efficient for me to interact with this very um, unsteady wake. So I'll swim along the side. Uh, I'll, I'll swim just outside this unsteady reach. Okay, um, so, uh, to figure out how much energy this guy was saving, we uh, basically created a clone of the smart follower doing the same actions, but in the absence of a leader, just to compare how much energy this um, smart follower is using versus how much energy the other 
uh, follower would use, or not a follower, a, a solitary fish doing the same actions would use. And we realized that this smart follower is roughly 32% more efficient. Uh, in comparison, it has about 11% higher speed. Uh, just doing the same motions, but interacting with the wake leads to all of this benefit. Um, then um, this tells us that, okay, fine, the reinforcement learning algorithm works well, and it is able to uh, come up with a good control algorithm for um, being energy efficient. The next question is why is this way of swimming an energy efficient um, approach? So again, we did a lot of data analysis and uh, here we're looking at the oncoming vortex that interacts with the boundary layer on the follower and generates this uh, lifted vortex L1. And this creates secondary vorticity right next to the body. And what this does is it generates a high speed region and this changes the force distribution acting on the body. And when we um, basically take the dot product of this force distribution with the motion of the body, we can uh, determine what's the power required for undulating the body. When we average that required power over many different cycles, the, we got the red line. And uh, you'll notice that these values are negative. This negative values never appear if we have a solitary swimmer, if we don't have a wake to interact with. So uh, what this negative power means is the uh, follower doesn't have to expend energy, rather the fluid flow, the flow induced forces are helping in the propulsion, in the undulation of the follower. So um, doing all of this analysis, we were able to understand why interacting with the wake was energy efficient. It was because of the way the oncoming wake interacts with the undulating body. Okay, so um, the next question we had was, how robust is this control algorithm? So on the left, we have a, a video of two fish uh, swimming together, a real fish. And on the right, we have uh, this leader is human controlled and we just tell it to execute random turns left and right. The follower is autonomous. And again, we see it wants to interact with the leader's wake. Uh, it is free to do whatever it wants, but to maximize efficiency, it chooses to interact with the wake. So um, the next thing to think about is uh, fine. We have this very nice way of controlling autonomous swimmers. What what? Can, how can we use this information to um, uh, to enforce to basically implement? Um, efficient swimming in a perhaps a different scenario. So to do that, uh, the this I'll, I'll explain everything on this graph one by one. Um, the green bar graphs basically show the probability of the follower maintaining a particular distance from the leader. So this horizontal distance is what's plat plotted on the x-axis. And when the follower is not smart yet, meaning during uh, the initial stages of training, you see there's a very large spread. There's no specific place the follower wants to stay at. But after training, uh, during the last uh, few uh, 10,000 iterations, the follower wants to stay at very specific locations, this 1.5 and 2.25, uh, where we see the peaks in the bar. And the black curve here is showing us the correlation between the motion of the head of the follower and the wake flow. So these preferred positions correspond uh, well to the uh, high correlation between the motion of the fish and the uh, wake flow direction. Okay, knowing all of this, we can think about, all right, can we do this sort of control in three dimensions? Uh, if you remember, um, energy efficient swimming is not an easy control problem. But now we, we know what, what happens with this two dimensional case. That's what we were talking about on the previous slide. So in three dimensions, what we did was, okay, let's identify positions where if there were a follower present, um, where would its head motion coin, uh, synchronize with the wake flow motion? 
So these are the hotspots shown in yellow. So now we have an easy control problem again. If, you, if I want an efficient follower, I should tell it to maintain position in this region. Now I can use my uh, traditional feedback controllers to, to achieve this uh, objective. Okay, so let's look at the results. So again, the leader is um, uh, just under our control. And this time the follower is also under our control, uh, human control. It's using a feedback controller to try and maintain position in this vicinity. And you see it interacts with the oncoming uh, vortex ring, the wake ring in a very specific manner. And when we looked at the efficiency of that follower compared to that leader, the blue line is the efficiency graph of the follower. On average, we again saw uh, roughly a 12% increase in efficiency. And uh, we again did a lot of analysis on what was happening. So as the uh, ring, a uh, wake ring comes and hits the follower and as it moves down the body, it generates a lifted ring, similar to the lifted vortex we had in the 2D case. And as it moves along the body, it um, modulates the efficiency. Uh, so the red circle, uh, red triangle here corresponds to the red picture here. And the green triangle corresponds to the picture on the right. All right. And another thing you might have noticed was there are two the rows of vortices. So uh, potentially we can use both of these to benefit. Okay. And uh, we placed two followers on either side. And again, you see the oncoming ring hits the follower in a very specific way. And we observed an 11% increase in efficiency for each of them, both the left and the right followers. Okay. So um, we were able to basically use this autonomous control algorithm to uh, allow our swimmers to have swim efficiently and then basically reverse engineer why the, that was the optimal answer. Um, next, let me uh, tell you some of the work we did with flow sensing. So um, when swimming in this large group, the fish have to be able to sense what's happening in their environment and one obvious um, sensing organ is the eyes. So they have visual feedback of uh, what's happening in the environment. But if we think about fish swimming in very deep waters, there's a, rarely, there's a very little light that penetrates that deep. And um, also if the water is muddy or there's a lot of dirt, it becomes uh, difficult to see anything. So there's an alternative a sensing organ that fish have, which is called the lateral line. Uh, th this is uh, the dots we see in the picture on top here, basically are the structures that comprise this lateral line. Um, and it, it's found in many, basically all, diff all fish species. So here we have a cave blind Mexican cave fish on the left. <clears throat> we have a zebra fish on the right here. Again, we can see the little dots that comprise this structure. So what these dots are, they are basically hair-like structures that um, respond to the flow. Um, and there's two different types. The superficial neuromass, which sense uh, shear stress changes, and there's canal neuromass. So on this sketch here, you can see um, a long line. It's basically a canal that's um, just present just below the uh, skin. And that also contains these uh, hair-like structures. Okay, so um, the question we had was, um, is there an optimal arrangement of these sensory cells or sensory structures along the body that help the fish max, uh, identify external disturbances? To try and answer this question, we uh, basically uh, set up a simulation case where there was a self-propelled fish, this time executing intermittent motion. And then we have an external disturbance source, in this case, an oscillating cylinder. So you'll notice that um, as soon as the cylinder starts oscillating, the flow field on the body of the swimmer, um, it changes in response. And, um, and basically the, to identify where we should place a sensor on this body of the swimmer, 
to identify what's the distance from the cylinder, what angle is it at. We conducted various different um, uh, simulations like this where the cylinder was placed at many different locations. So uh, imagine that there's an imaginary uh, box as uh, shown here, and we can place the cylinder at any location in, within this box region. So uh, once we do that and the fish swims past this disturbance, and let's say it's a blind fish, it doesn't know the location of the box. All it can do is use these sensors present on the surface of its body to measure changes in shear stress or changes in pressure distribution. And uh, we run uh, on the order of uh, a few hundred simulations with many, uh, with the cylinder placed at different locations. And um, the way we try to identify the best sensor placement location is initially the fish has no idea where the cylinder is placed. So we use an, a uniform prior, meaning the probability distribution of finding the cylinder is equal within any, at any location within this region. But after taking the measurement, we can update this estimate. Uh, we, we call it a posterior distribution. So after recording data from these uh, uh, vibration-induced changes in the flow field, we update our probability distribution. And the difference in this prior and posterior distribution is what uh, is called, uh, what uh, gives us um, and the best location for the sensor. Okay, so to give a bit more detail on that, so let's say here's two scenarios where I place a sensor at a bad location on the fish's body. So the uh, prior is uniform, that's the blue line, and after taking measurements, um, our distribution changes very slightly, that's the red line. So it's not a very informative uh, placement for the sensor. But in the bottom case, if we have a very good sensor placement, we get a huge jump in the probability of locating the cylinder. So this is a, uh, this picture corresponds to a very good sensor placement. All right. And we can basically compute this um, uh, utility function for many different locations. So we put one sensor in the head, then farther back, farther back, and we measure the utility value of each of these individually. That's the curve shown here. The best sensor out of all of these is where the utility is maximum. So it, that tells me I should place a sensor right over here. Okay. Um, and if we think about what's the physical meaning of this best sensor, um, it, it basically tells us this sensor location is uh, best able to distinguish between different cylinder placements, okay? And uh, if you look a bit more at the flow field, what happens at these best locations? So this is where the fluctuations in the tangential velocity is the maximum. The bright spots indicate high fluctuation regions in tangential velocity, uh, not in tangential velocity, in U and V components. So, um, where things change the most, it makes sense that we should place a sensor over there. Okay. Um, so once we place our first sensor, what happens next? Um, we, we uh, given that our first sensor is already placed, now we can place a second sensor and third sensor and so on. And when we do that, we get this sort of a distribution of sensors on the body. This is showing a distribution of 20 sensors and the numbers indicate uh, the order of placement. So first sensor placed here and so on. Um, if uh, when we did this sort of sensor placement for many different uh, disturbance types, meaning uh, an oscillating cylinder, a rotating cylinder, or a, a vortex shedding case, from all of the combined cases, we got very high density of shear stress sensors in the head and in the tail. But on the other hand, if we change the quantity that was being sensed from shear stress to pressure gradient, we got a different distribution. So there's still a high gradient, high density in the head, but now we have a more of a uniform distribution along the body. 
And if we look at what happens in real fish, so this is ob obviously a sketch, but uh, uh, in, in real fish, we find a high density of these superficial neuromas, meaning shear stress sensors in the head and in the tail. Whereas the subsurface canal, the pressure gradient sensor is distributed uh, more evenly along the body with a high, high density in the uh, head. All right. So um, our uh, optimal sensor placement algorithm gives us uh, something that resembles what happens in nature. How, how well does it perform in identifying an unknown disturbance? So here we said, okay, let's place sensors at the optimal location and let's place a cylinder that's oscillating at this diamond location. The fish doesn't know where it's placed. It's, it has to uh, guess where the uh, oscillating cylinder is placed. So um, with this optimal sensor placement that the probability distribution is shown in the bright colors and the fish is uh, re reasonably good at uh, predicting the correct location of the oscillating cylinder. Instead, if I had placed a uh, um, sensor at, let's say, I don't know where I should place it, I'll just place it midway through the body. In this case, you see the probability is much more spread out. There's no way for the fish to identify, okay, the cylinder is over here. It says, oh, I don't, uh, I think there's a high probability it's in this region or in this region or even in this corner. So that's not a very good um, uh, sensor placement location. And if you think about the use of this, such an approach, if you're designing an underwater vehicle and you need these flow sensors and you have only a few of them to place on your uh, vehicle, where should you place them? So this sort of an approach tells us, okay, place them in the front. And um, if, if you place three pairs, place two pairs in the front and one pair in the back. So going from one pair to three pairs, we see the probability distribution getting tighter, meaning it, the fish is more certain that the cylinder is located here. And with uniform one third, two third, um, uh, well, not exactly a third, but uniform placement along the body um, also gives us a good probability distribution, but not as good as the optimal sensor locations. And we can go even higher with five pairs. We're almost certain that the cylinder is located here, which is the correct position. And with a more uniform distribution, also we're getting better. All right. So um, the optimal sensors that the algorithm determines, uh, the positions that it determines uh, are very uh, effective in locating an external disturbance source. All right, and uh, next, let me tell you about some recent work we did on intermittent swimming. So um, some background on intermittent locomotion. Uh, this sort of locomotion is found in all fish, uh, all uh, an animal species. Here we're looking at bounding flight in a bird where it flaps its wings a few times and then basically does an unpowered glide. Um, the same thing happens in fish. Here we have zebra fish swimming in a tank. You will see they flick their tails a few times and then just glide along on an unpowered path. And uh, again, there are many explanations for why this might happen. There's, this might lower the energy requirement for swimming. This reduces the disturbance generated by the fish in the water, which is better for not avoid uh, alerting either predators or prey. Also, when you you're on this um, unpowered glide, your sensory field gets stabilized. So think of us um, running with our head moving uh, a lot. Um, that's uh, it's difficult becomes difficult to see what's happening around us. So that glide phase allows them to better see what's happening as well as sense the flow around them. All right. So uh, here we um, actually teamed up with an experimental group uh, who had these uh, tetra fish swimming in a tank with an imp Im imposed inflow. And we see these three different behaviors. On the left, we have this uh, tail beat just to one side. And in the middle, we have tail beat to left and right, and then a glide. 
and on the right we have more or less continuous swimming. So the questions we had was, what's the reason for this behavior? What's the flow physics behind this? And can we use this behavior to design better biomimetic vehicles? So the first task was to extract the midlines from all of those videos I was showing you. Here you see very clearly that there's a preference for a left tail beat. So the head would be here and the tail is over here. Uh, so this is the one-sided tail beat uh, mode. This is where we flick the tail once left, right, and then coast. And on the bottom, we have more or less continuous swimming. Okay, so once we extract these midlines, we can impose this undulation in Navier-Stokes simulations. So everything I'll show you again is self-propelled, uh, meaning we never impose an inflow. Uh, we just impose the body body undulations. And all the translation and rotation again happens because of the fluid solid interaction. All right, so let's look at what happens with the first case where we have continuous swimming. So that's the experimental video that slowed down a bit. And then this is what we got from the simulation. This is happening in real time. The uh, first second or so was uh, basically analytical motion, but then I switch over to experimental motion. So this is based on uh, real motion observed from the experiments. Um, okay, And uh, we, we do the same for the other two scenarios where we have the uh, tail beat once left, once right, and then coast. So again, initially we have analytical motion and then switch left, right, coast, left, right, coast, left, right. Okay, And then the third case we talked about was the half tail beat where flick only to one side and then coast. So analytical, then switch, flick to one side, coast, left, coast. Okay, so uh, um, it, it's very obvious that the flow uh, wake structure looks very different for all of these three different scenarios. And also the speed of swimming is very different. So for continuous swimming, it was roughly close to three body lengths per second. Multiple ta tail beat mode is one body length per second, and this is 0 0.3. Uh, half tail beat mode is 0 0.3. All right. So the first thing we think about is okay, how well do these simulated cases represent what's happening in reality? So we basically looked at <clears throat> the speed of the swimmers, all of them starting from rest. And this is the initial. Uh, uh, phase I was mentioning where we have nice sinusoidal undulations. Then we switch to experimental and steady speed we observed for the continuous swimmer was 2.95 body lengths per second. And in experiments, we measured 2.69 body lengths per second. Same thing for the other two, 0 0.92 versus 0 0.87, 0 0.32 versus 0 0.36. So all of these steady speed, steady state speeds match between experiment and uh, simulations to within 11%. Okay, so we were happy that okay we we seem to um, be representing what's happening in the experiment uh, relatively well. Next thing we looked at was uh, how much power are each of these uh, swimmers using. So um, here red is the continuous swimmer and we expect the power consumption to be relatively high because the speed of the continuous swimmer is much higher. Then we said, okay, to uh, let's look at efficiency instead. And that's the highlighted part I'm showing here. Um, something we observed that uh, I had suspected but not uh, expected entirely as the efficiency was highest for continuous swimming, close to 25%. For this intermittent burst and coast motion, the efficiency seemed to drop. Um, and to analyze this a bit further, we said, okay, since our fish never swim um, in a continuous manner at slow speeds, let's create a fake fish. So uh, let's take our fast swimmer and make it slow down by artificially expanding the time steps. So. Um, what I mean is we take the continuous swimmer here and 
basically expand the time steps in between. So it does the same motions, but uh, more slowly. So obviously we expect the speed will be slower and then even slower here. What this allows us to do is <clears throat> now we have swimmers swimming at the same speeds as the intermittent motion uh, swimmers I showed you earlier. And now we can do a direct comparison of energy consumption. When we did that, uh, we again noticed that the efficiency of continuous swimming, uh, the part highlighted here was uh, higher than the efficiency of the intermittent gates. So this, uh, uh, this result is, um, it's contrary to what's usually mentioned in the literature that intermittent locomotion is uh, more efficient. Um, so uh, we found that energy efficiency might not be at play. What, what other reasons could these intermittent gates have? So one possible reason is it enhances sensing as we talked about earlier. And there's another possible reason. Uh, we looked through the literature and we realized that there was a minimum threshold on the tailbeat frequency. So if you force the uh, fish to swim at very low speeds, it cannot beat its tails very slowly. There's a minimum threshold which it should operate at. Um, so those are questions that uh, for us are still open at the moment. We haven't answered them con conclusively. Um, so uh, let me give you a quick summary of everything we talked about. Uh, first, we talked about collective swimming, where we were able to use these, teach these autonomous swimmers to harness energy from unsteady wakes. And this sort of a control approach was very robust to perturbations. Then we talked about optimal sensor placement, where um, we, um, uh, the, uh, the algorithm predicted uh, sensor locations which match what we see in happen in nature. And these sort of algorithms uh, can be very useful when we have a limited number of sensors and we need to sense what's happening in a non-visual manner. And then uh, the last thing we talked about was intermittent swimming. So in intermittent gates seem to be less efficient since there's a power surge required for frequently uh, accelerating from the deceleration that happens during coasting. Um, other potential causes for intermittent swimming might be enhanced sensing or lower threshold on tail bit frequency. Um, that for uh, us is an open question at the moment. So I uh, think that's it. And let me take any questions if you have any. Thank you very much for this talk, this amazing uh, movies and animation that you've shown. So uh, if anyone has uh, questions, can raise hand or write in the chat. So is there any question? Okay, uh, I have a question um, about the first part of the talk. Um, in particular, uh, my, my, my concern is that uh, the, when you have two fish, there's a leading and a training fish, um, it seems that the wake of the, of the leading um, fish is somehow periodic. Uh, so my question is, have you also uh, tried to perform simulation when the motion of the training fish is I mean, more complicated? Uh, or the you, you still see yeah. my screen? Yeah. Okay, so uh, during training, we never expose the uh, follower to um, a non-periodic okay. wave, but we see here, this is yeah. a, um, this random, changes in heading uh, creates uh, non-periodicity, but uh, th that's okay. why I was saying that follower is still robust to perturbation. Okay, so in this case, it is a change in the direction. Okay, so yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is there a question? 
Okay, so there is a question by Jeremy Rowe. Um, optimal sensor placement uh, uh, was uh, was the fish stationary while sensing the location of the cylinder, or was it moving around? How does movement affect the sensing accuracy? Yeah. So um, for the sensor placement, the uh, fish was. Uh, it was exactly this movie I'm showing you. So uh, the fish measures what's happening as it's coasting along. So you see these changes, fluctuations, that's what it measures. And we used three different cases, one with this oscillating uh, cylinder, and there's two more. Let me see if I have the videos. Uh, let me just check. So there were other external disturbances that we exposed it to. Um, there was a rotating cylinder and there was a uh, vortex wake from a D-shaped cylinder, uh, but I don't seem to have those movies here. So um, yeah, um, I don't have them. Um, basically, we had uh, this uh, left-right oscillation, we had a rotation, and then um, we had the D-shaped cylinder, and the result of all three combined is what gives us this uh, placement. In the D-shaped cylinder case, the fish was not moving. In that case, it was static. Okay. So there is a question. Uh, yeah, if you if you have a question, you can turn off your microphone. Um, um, get so on. I, I can read the question. Uh, are you able to see the question on my screen? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So let's see, um, in the collective swimming, um, will you expect energy saving if you train with another reward function? Um, if we train with another reward function, um, so we basically use two different reward functions. Uh, one was um, stay behind the leader and the other was the energy efficiency. So in the, in the first case, we were not expecting energy efficiency. We were thinking, okay, it needs to spend a lot of energy to, every time it gets kicked out of the wake, it needs to spend energy to come back. But that's not what ended up happening. So unexpectedly, uh, we did get energy savings. So to answer your question, it's not, uh, if you use a different, um, if you use a different reward function for the reinforcement learning, it might, just find the best way to save energy at the same time as um, uh, achieving the goal you specify. If you look, if you uh, notice, there was a very recent article from Google where they had uh, RL reinforcement learning flying their uh, balloons and they didn't expect that um, the balloons would do some actions. Uh, and it turns out that if they let them do the, those unexpected actions, they flew to their destination in much shorter times. So it's never easy to tell with these algorithms. That's one of the disadvantages and the advantage. There is uh, there are two questions. I mean, they raised their hand. Get on, get on. They note. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So the next Sorry. question is from Intisaf, who's actually uh, actually yeah here, the picture here. So yeah, yeah there's yeah. Uh, the question is, have you tried with continuous swimming? Um, so let me see, let me see, let me see. Uh, this, uh, no, uh, we tried with continuous swimming, this case. What was happening was during continuous swimming, you see there's a, the boundary layer is uh, changing just because of the motion of the fish itself. So it becomes very difficult to sense any signals coming from an external source. That's why we had to use this intermittent gate uh, and, and sense the external disturbance during this glide phase. Okay, then um, next question is uh, collective swimming. You observed improved efficiency. Would you know how this compares to similar schooling results for rigid body swimmers? So by rigid body swimmers, I'm assuming you mean if I replace my undulating swimmer with a, uh, with an airfoil. Um, okay, so um, 
um, here we have um, we do have an undulating swimmer here, but uh, it's uh, with uh, if you have an airfoil that's heaving or pitching, you would get the same um, sort of energy efficiency if you are able to interact with the vortices in a smart manner. So uh, technically, you you should get the same uh, benefit. Of of course, the details will be slightly different. The way you interact will be slightly different. Uh, but but yeah, you, energy efficiency sh should happen. And uh, there have been experiments that have showed that. Um, okay, let me see. There are two questions from the audience. Is Gretan Renault that Bryson is in? So I'm sorry, please. can you say that once more? Uh, I didn't hear that. Can you speak louder? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Professor Verma. Thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question uh, regarding the first part of your presentation when you presented us results about the, uh, the swimmer that was trained to maximize the efficiency of its swimming. And um, you, you showed us uh, a result where you, you, there were several positions that were actuators, sorry, actuators regarding the distance between the two swimmers. And there was uh, a certain, I think, around one body length and another around two body length. And the, 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 the follower were uh, exactly this slide, uh, trying to, um, to, to be around that position. And uh, I, I think there have been several publications around the, the same topic on uh, rigid body swimmers with a more imposed, uh, with more imposed uh, movement and displacements. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of the world of uh, Baker, for instance, Shelley, Ristruff, uh, and, and others. And there were questions around that. They have shown that uh, passive swimmers are attractive to several points with these, uh, with these patterns. But there was a question about an unsteady uh, branches that could be between two positions, between two attractors. And my question is, uh, during the uh, training, have you observed that uh, the fish would be attracted in a position that would stand between these two attractors, maybe in a transient way, but uh, still that would benefit from, from it. Or, or maybe it's more something that uh, will never occur because it's uh, not a, 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 an efficient uh, position. So you, you see the green bars are basically yes. the, during training, the fish explores all positions. Um, and uh, between these two attractors, uh, it's not able to find uh, another attractor here. Um, so um, I, well, during uh, this particular training episode, uh, that was not found to be an efficient uh, location to maintain. Um, I don't, uh, again, it's very difficult to say if you change the reward criterion slightly, what will end up happening? Will you discover this third attractor point or not? I, I cannot tell you for sure. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, there's another question. Oh, was there another question before this? Yeah, there is a question by Bing Tai Chen. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dr. Wama, uh, this is a very interesting topic for me. I'm fl from aerospace and more related to experimental aerodynamics. So I have a Question for you. So, how to set up the fish uh, in Navistock simulation with, uh, I mean, like a swimming pattern? Uh, because I, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, numerical simulations. Oh, are you asking me how we set yeah. up the swimming patterns? Yeah. Okay. How to set up, yeah, the, the fish, you see, mm -hmm. the, fish, yeah, the fish has certain techniques and the curvature, right? Uh, oh, okay, okay. So the way we do that, um, there's many different ways you can do that. Uh, it, one is immersed boundary methods. If you're familiar with it, uh, we use something called uh, uh, penalty, um, uh, Brinkman penalization. Okay. So uh, if you notice the fish here, the grid points that are occupied by the solid object have this forcing term here. So when we impose an undulatory motion, the fluid um, cells are, um, they're forced to the same velocity. It's basically the flow, fluid is moving at the same velocity as the solid object. So that's the way we implement it in our simulations. There's many different ways of doing this. 
Absolutely. And this is one of the more difficult things to do in in when we stop simulations. Okay, thank you very much. That's my question. All right, and then there was one more in the okay. chat. Yeah, there is time for last question. It's in the chat. Uh, if the way so... the leader are too chaotic, how will these affect the follower? So the Reynolds numbers we uh, were able to do all of these are DNS direct numerical simulation. So we were limited to Reynolds number on the order of. Um, uh, 4,000, 5,000. Uh, if you go much higher, the nice clean wakes that we get in this three-dimensional case here, they will be uh, more prone to breaking down. And in that case, it becomes more difficult to identify an optimal way of swimming. But again, reinforcement learning or other machine learning techniques are ideal for this because they do trial and error. Uh, doing this analytically is close to impossible, uh, at least at the moment. Um, so yeah, you, you can technically train um, uh, more um, uh, a, a different case, you would end up getting a slightly different answer. All right. Hey, 